All right, please welcome our next speaker, Dr. Maiti Le, uh, who's going to be joining us to discuss her journey from a refugee camp to the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, she is a technologist, an entrepreneur, and educator, and she received her PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from UC Berkeley. So um, without further ado, please give it away. Okay, so hello everybody. So I thought, um, I just want to find out uh, qu quickly, how many of you are in California? Okay, so um, where, else, where's, where else is everybody? Okay, so I'm not going to give a long boring talk because it's really, really hot at my house. And in fact, I'm hiding in the back bedroom because we have uh, my brother, his partner, my nephew, my daughter, and my husband are all in the living room. So I'm hiding in the back rooms. It's very, very hot. So instead of giving a long, boring talk, I wanted to um, have a session where actually I want to learn more about you guys, about who you are, um, what you're doing right now, and why are you participate in this um, in this conference when you could be out doing something else. Like, for example, if I weren't here, I would be in the pool because it's really hot in California at the moment, okay? So I want this more to be an interactive and I want it more so you, learning what you want to know instead of giving a speech about how wonderful I am, which I am sure none of you really care, right? <laughs> um, so, Tell me, why are you here? Why are you at this conference? What are you hoping to get out of this conference? Okay, our audience is a little shy sometimes, um, so I'll yeah. start. Um, well, personally, I know I organized a lot of it um, with, of course, with the STEMI team. And um, the reason we organized and well attended is because um, a lot of people don't get great exposure to STEM through like normal classes. Like for example, with physics, I feel like the physics talks we had this morning were amazing. Like, and it goes so far beyond the, any physics that like you learn in AP physics, which is, or like AP physics one at least, which is normally the only physics class that high schoolers even take. And physics wasn't even mandatory till the last year for our school. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people don't like, they don't realize how cool all of those STEM subjects are because they're just taught like those skills very in a very like I don't know monotonous and kind of technical mm -hmm. manner mm -hmm. like okay here's Newton's law this is what you need to know so we wanted to like explore all of the different disciplines and um yeah, yeah. Okay. okay I'll I'll give other people a chance yeah so um I'm attending this first also because I did help um like organize it, but mainly because I find uh, a great interest in a lot of the subjects, you know, spoken in these, uh, in this thing. Like a lot of the subjects can affect me and what I think about on a day-to-day -day basis and how, what I want to do in engineering or in all these subjects in, in a field. So like, it's always nice to know what's happening, even though if you know stuff, it's good to have like more of an understanding, I guess. So that's a good reason too. Okay. Anybody else? Um, um, I know I attended it because um, I kind of want to learn more about like physics and math and kind of like what I want to go into at in university. And I feel like through my um, like what type of engineering or just like anything like that. And at school, I can't really figure that out. Uh -huh. So I think that's why I really attended this conference. Okay. And who who's just spoke? Um, hi, that was me, Lauren Bridgewater. <laughs> okay, so um, I um, I will I will I'm going to tell you a story um, about what the reason why I ask questions for you guys is because this is what I do with my own student at Stanford. So I spend a lot of time talking to them and listening to what they have to say. So I started out teaching a class. The joke is at Stanford, I started teaching graduate student. Then I started teaching a, a required class for graduate and senior. 
And then I went down to teach a class that's required uh, if you want to declare a major as electrical engineering at Stanford. And then at the end, I end up teaching a freshman seminar. And that's why I stay for a long time. Um, I keep moving down the ladder. And the class that I coach hard with Professor Andrew Goldsmith was called The Art and Science of Engineering Design. So we take a bunch of freshmen who didn't know anything about engineering um, and we put them in a the class and we say, form a team, pick a topic, any topic that you can, you think that's any way related to engineering will, will help you work on a project. That's, a, that's the premise of the class that I came up with. And it was so simple and yet it was so powerful. And we have students and the students absolutely love the class. Um, the class um, is incredibly popular. Um, every year, there are about 200 freshmen and sophomore seminars at Stanford. And every year they give out an award for what they call the excellent award. Uh, they would pick a, a project or a team or a student out of those 200 seminars to give out the excellence award. And every time we teach the class, our students win the award. In fact, one time we actually um, nominated two teams and one won the prize and the other one was the runner up. So the second time, we taught, the next time we taught the class, we also nominated two teams and we got back a very snooty email from the committee saying, hey, you know, you're only allowed to nominate it once. So we didn't want one and they won anyway. And the reason why is because the student get a chance to work on something of their interest and that's related to engineering. But what's really interesting that I found was, like I said, I spent a lot of time work, working with a student, talking to the student inside the class and outside the classroom. Um, and many of them, especially young women would come up to me and say, you know, I would, I would go do engineering if it were more socially relevant. And I heard that over and over again. And after a while, it really struck a nerve in me because I was beginning to ask myself that question. I was very lucky. I went to college, I graduated, I went to work in Silicon Valley at the very beginning of the networking boom. So I work on uh, all sorts of networking project um, and became very successful because it was such a hot field at the time. But the more I start working on it, the more I question myself of, so what is all this for? So it's great that you have Facebook, right? You can chat with your friends. It's great that you have Google that you can do search. It's great that you have DoorDash and you can order food and you don't even have to go and pick up, whatever. But how is it socially relevant? How is it really directly affecting people's lives, changing people's lives? And just as my students were questioning themselves, amazingly enough, at the very beginning of their career as college student, I was asking myself that way, way past my college career, right? Way into my own professional career. And so because of that, I started working with many NGOs and many uh, not-for-profit companies that directly affected people's lives, okay? So I learned so much from my student because of the questions that they have in their lives that forces me to question my own life, okay? I could very easily just keep on working exactly the way I have always been I can, you know, I'm an angel investor. I can probably go get a job working with a venture capitalist firm. I have worked with startup throughout my career. I can keep on doing all those things. It wasn't satisfying to me. It wasn't important enough to me. So let me give you an example of the kind of things that I'm helping uh, young entrepreneurs working on right now. So, um, do you guys remember, maybe you were too young, but in 2007, 2008, there was a huge crisis, health crisis in Africa. It was the Ebola crisis. And people were dying. People were dying by the thousands. And they were just people, 
were desperate to stop it and they didn't quite know what to do, okay? There were two young college graduates from UC Santa Cruz who worked in, in Nigeria at the time. And they came to Nigeria working on um, making the healthcare system in Nigeria more up to date, more modern. They wanted to computerize, they wanna digitalize the Nigerian healthcare system. They just happened to have the most up-to-date maps of Nigeria at the time. They have a more up-to-date maps of Nigeria than the government of Nigeria, than the UN. So when Ebola came, spread, was spreading through Africa, it was coming to Nigeria and they have a map and they were able to trace, they along with a young team of Nigerians, computer nerds, <laughs> um, they were to look in the maps and figure out where the Ebola crisis was coming and where it was going. So there were three organizations that were responsible for stopping the Ebola crisis in Nigeria. It was a local organization that had to do with burial because in fact, that was how Ebola was spreading was when you bury people, um, the people who do the burial get infected and then they went home and infected others. So that was an organization that was helping stopping the Ebola crisis in Nigeria. It was the Doctors Without Border organization because they were the one with the uh, all these sort of makeshift hospital that was trying to save people who get infected. And then there's eHealth Nigeria, which is now called eHealth Africa, that will be able to go in and determine where to get people away, to get people from the Ebola center and stop in the crisis. Okay, so I happen to be supporting eHealth Nigeria at the time, now eHealth Africa, and it's supporting these young, two young UC Santa Cruz uh, graduates in that process. Okay, so from that little organization, they are now have an organization with about $20 million annually. They have about 600 employees and they were working on six or seven different countries within Africa. Okay, so it is relevant because, you know, 12 years later, we are at this place where we are now facing with another pandemic, right? And that's what we're working on. So the eHealth um, Africa is one of the few organizations within Nigeria that have um, a testing center. So that's where people send testing example, a sample uh, to the lab. We also have um, a hospital where people um, with uh, COVID can come and be uh, quarantined and be treated. Okay. Um, they work on so amazing main things. So um, I still remember we were talking to with a young engineer working at eHealth Africa last year. Um, and he was working on a refrigerator. Basically what he was working on is a glorified cooler. The kind that you put beer and sandwiches in to take to the beach on a hot day like today. Okay, except that he was building on this super duper cooler to put in vaccines because we were working on a program to eliminate polio in Nigeria. So he was able to work on creating this amazing lightweight, tough, maintain the right temperature range cooler so that the community health worker can bring the vaccines to these very remote, very challenging regions to vaccinate hundreds of thousands, millions of people, especially children, okay? So my message to you today is, there's beauty in mathematics. There's beauty in astronomy. There's beauty in um, the genome projects. There's so many things that you guys can do. There's so many things that you can make a difference in the world. There's so many things that you can explore. What I would like to encourage you to do is especially in the current environment, go look at the world, 
and ask yourself, what can I do? How do I use the technology to create a better, better world? Okay, because frankly, my generation, we screwed up, right? We are leaving you a pretty messed up world. And what we count, and the reason why I am so passionate about teaching, I spend a lot of time teaching and working with young people because I believe that you guys, my kids, you guys, the next generation is going to be able to ask, I think, a more, more relevant questions, more out of the box questions to solve the world's problems. Okay, so there is such value in technology, in engineering, where you can ask these amazing questions. And from those questions, you can come up with amazing answer to get ourselves in the mess that we, we're in. Okay. So I can go on, I can tell you many other stories about other projects, about other ideas, but what I really want to do is I want to hear from you guys. Ask me questions. Tell me what you think. I think it's more, it's more important. It's more relevant for you guys. Um, and did you say, are you currently teaching at Stanford or? So I was teaching at Stanford, but the problem that I have is that um, um, I, I get involved in two things. So I teach two classes at Stanford. One is called the Art and Science of Engineering Design. And the other class that I teach, not surprising, is called Engineering for Good. So I, in the class, we have a bunch of students from all sorts of disciplines, uh, from anywhere from mechanical engineering to history and English major to uh, HumBio, which is hum human biology. Uh, they come and they work with NGOs and not-for-profit company on projects that engineering for good. So I take those two classes. I'm also involved with the international summer high school program at Stanford. And um, I should be teaching right now uh, because that's when the summer international summer high school program at Stanford is happening. But of course it's not happening this year. Um, and um, I'm supposed to be teaching in January for my engineering for good, uh, for the art and science of engineering design. But I'm not teaching it because uh, it's gonna be online and for the class to work because the student need to be working together, building stuff, designing things. It's just not, um, um, I didn't think that it would be an effective uh, class to be teaching online right, right now. I might consider do it in the future, but not at the moment. So no, I'm not teaching at the moment. I'm very sad about it actually. Yeah, that makes sense. It's definitely, it's just really cool to hear about all the classes at Stanford because that's actually like my top choice right now. So sure. I know um yeah it's just really interesting to learn about all the classes mm -hmm. there anybody has any other questions for me what um what has been like the biggest challenge in your career um what's the biggest challenge in my career or like career pathway leading up to your career yeah so that's the thing is that my biggest challenge was for me to face up to the fact that I didn't want a career. For me to face up the fact that I didn't want to climb a ladder, that I didn't want to follow a traditional trajectory of what I wanted to do. That was the hardest. That was the hardest thing when I realized that um, these are classes that I, I only want to teach these classes. I'm not willing to teach anything else. Or the fact that I'm really interested in working with high school summer programs, uh, you know, uh, sort of choosing what's relevant to me. Uh, seeking out the kind of entrepreneurs who are working on um, ideas on companies uh, and organization that speak to me and speak to my, my interests and my conviction. So that's really hard. Okay, um, me and my family have, uh, I don't wanna do like a super grand introduction, but we actually like 
a year or so ago. We started this small nonprofit um, organization to help fund, like do monthly funds or yearly funds for our family back in Africa. Mm -hmm. That um, people back in Africa that are in need of it. So schools, children that are in a deficit of supplies and money and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, my my mother is also from Cameroon in Africa. So we have a lot of connections and stuff like that. But I was like recently over the summer, I did like a lot of business research and I got really inspired and interested in business. And I, I want to ask first, like what kind of um, investing do you do you do like what do you invest into like like ah, yeah. yeah so you know I think that's amazing so I think that um, one of the things that I love to do is once a year I go to Nigeria and meet up with the um, with the teens um, in in Nigeria and what I'm always amazed I love doing that because because I'm so inspired when I talk to the young people who work uh, at eHealth Africa, how, how entrepreneurial they are and how driven they are and how tech savvy they are. And the, the, I think that, you know, when we sit in Silicon Valley, I had no idea how entrepreneurial and how tech savvy and how business savvy young people in Africa are. I mean, there are just so many opportunities. There are people who are working on, uh, for example, starting um, uh, like uh, motorcycle ride sharing program. Uh, people working on um, uh, delivering goods in remote villages. There were just so many things that young people in Africa that are working on that just really, really inspiring. Um, if you're interested, get in touch with me. I would put you in touch with uh, a colleague of mine who is doing just that. Her, her job is to sort of help train and, and nurture and mentor young entrepreneur in, in Africa. And so there are lots of opportunity. It's really exciting. It's wonderful to see. Oh, I'd love to get in touch. Yeah. Um, that. Usually people always ask me when I go to these conferences, they always me like, you don't get to have your card. I never carry cards anymore. I, I think I have a stack of business cards somewhere up in my office. But I say, you know, these days, if you really want to find me, you'll find me. And usually people do. So, okay. yeah, you want to get in touch with me, do. Right? Where can I, like, where can I contact you? Uh, f find me. I'm not, I'm not hard to find online. I try very hard to keep a very low profile, but it's very easy to find me and find me. And then, you know, just let me know where, where we met and then we'll go from there. Okay? Okay. All right, thank yeah. you. And I don't have a lot of time, so I'll, bye. Bye. Given that there are two young few women in the room, what advice would you give them that they are not intimidated and they are not too young? Um, I think so. Someone is, was trying to say something, but I can't hear them clearly. See. Given there are very few women in engineering still, what <laughs> advice can you give these young women on how not to be intimidated when they're in a room full of men? Oh, okay. So this is, I have to tell you a little secret, okay? So usually when, um, when I first started out, I think the number of women in engineering was 2%. I think the number is now maybe five or 10%, right? We haven't gone that far. And my, my trick is, is this. Now, number one is that when I walk into a room um, and there's a sea of men, and usually there's one or two women, you know what usually I notice? Those are the best, smartest, toughest engineers out there, right? You have to be, that's just the way it is. Um, it is challenging, it is tough, but one thing I really like about being an engineer and being with other engineers is that, that um, there is a language that we use, right? Whether you write code or whether you build cars or whatever it is, there's a language that we use. And I think that once you speak that language, um, 
I think it's easier. I think it's probably easier to be a female engineer, oddly enough, than be a female lawyer. In fact, I know that for, for a fact. I have lots of female friends who are lawyers, uh, partners in big law firms and such. Um, it is intimidating. It is tough. But, well, that's what it is. And realizing that there are a small number of women in the organization, look out for each other, help each other out, be kind to each other, nurture each other, don't stab each other in the back, right? Look out for each other, make sure that you get the sisterhood going, okay? And in fact, some of my, you know, some of my close friends are like that. You know, I, we usually seek each other out and we usually uh, sort of get each other's challenges in a way that our male friends, our male colleagues don't. Anything else? Um, Ivan asks, what can we do to keep women engineers to stay on Midway in their career? Oh, that's a great question. You know, um, it's not just engineers. Um, a friend of mine graduated from Harvard, um, Stanford Business School, and she said that when she went back on her 20th anniversary of, uh, of, of her year, half the women stopped working. They've done something else. And I think this is, this is the problem that we have, as I said before, because many um, of these women who work in high tech become disillusioned because we say, well, you know, it's great. You can, you can go work for, for Facebook, right? To get how many clicks in, in their ads, or you can go work for DoorDash to see how many people will order food online or whatever it is. So I think that one of the things that uh, for many women, for many people, but I think especially for many women who work in high tech is they say, what good is these things? What good are all these technologies? That's why I encourage you to go and look and say, how can we use these technology to make a better world? It's important, it's very sexy and it's very profitable to go and solve a problem for the top 1 billion people in the world, right? That's what we, everybody is doing in the Valley, pretty much. I'm encouraging you, especially the women who are questioning the value of technology and their place in, in high tech is to go and say, okay, so how are we gonna use this technology for the bottom 6 billion people? I think that women will stay around longer and they will work harder and they will push more because they will see the work that they do is meaningful and is important. And in fact, you already see, start seeing that. Any other question? I'm just talking to YouTube chat. Um, well, I think we've run out of questions. Um, okay. Been on here for a while. Oh, actually, Ivan has another question. Yeah. Are we more I innovative or less than before? Wait, okay. less than. That, I think that's a great question. That's a great question because um, I think, yes. I'm answering yes to both. I think because in some way, we are all a victims of the success, right? We all look at Silicon Valley, we all look at the Facebook of the world, we always, we all look at the, uh, the Instagram of the world and we say, we want more of that. So in a way we are less innovative. But if you go look and all the stuff, look at what the speaker before me was talking about how to use, you know, programming to work with bees. That's incredibly innovative. That's incredibly interesting. So there's also a bunch of people working on these really interesting, really innovative projects. Okay, so the answer is, is yes in, in, in both ways, in, in some very sort of perverse way that we look at the success and we want more of the same thing. And we don't think outside the box and we're not really asking the hard questions like, okay, so what's beyond this? 
That's a great question. Oh, so, um, yeah, so someone, asked, someone asked, what was moving to the US from another country like? Oh, you know, I came to the United States when I was 15 years old. And how many of you guys are 15? Is anybody here? Look, every, everybody's a bit older than 15, yeah? Okay, so I think at 15, um, I was very arrogant. I was very arrogant. I was very cocky. I thought that I could conquer the world. I thought I knew everything already. Um, so to me, coming to the United States was like a game. It's sort of, I don't want to minimize. Um, it was very tough. I, I lived, uh, uh, I was a foster child. Um, I lived in, I moved to three different foster homes in six months. Okay. I went to the worst, at the time, the worst performing high school in the state of California. So I don't want to minimize the, the tough times and the difficulty that I faced. But at the same time, um, I bought into the, the idea that this is the land of opportunity, that if I'm smart enough, if I work hard enough, um, I will get to where I needed to go. Um, in some way, thank God that I was so naive because it's not true, okay? I succeeded in a lot of ways because I was lucky far more than I was smart or far more than I was, because I was hardworking, but I was very lucky. But uh, came, coming to the America is sort of, for me, a chance for me to live that American uh, narrative that why all of us immigrants, most of us immigrants coming to the United States was, I was gonna get my American dream, right? I was gonna go for the brass ring and I'm gonna wrap it with both hands and hold on. And in high school, were you able to like access any STEM opportunities? I'm sorry? Were you able to access any STEM opportunities in high school still? Yeah, so when I was in high school, because I went to the worst performing high school in the state of California at the time. So in a way, when, you, when I walk into the classroom and I wanted to learn, I, was, I wanted so badly to be, I didn't speak English. I didn't have anybody to support me. When I walk into that classroom and they can see the fire in my eyes, they can see that I would do anything to succeed. I was willing to work hard. I was willing to do whatever it takes. All the teachers and all the counselors and all the administrators were just there for me. They just could not do enough for me and supported me. Right. They, um, I went to a community college to take classes because there wasn't enough AP classes in my own high school. So I ended up taking calculus and chemistry and physics in the local community college. And that was at the urging and the support of my own teachers and my own administrator in my own high school. So, you know, um, I was very lucky. Last thoughts. Okay. So, well, oh yeah, go ahead, sorry. So again, I really want to encourage you guys to go look beyond the obvious. And if you're wondering what the hell I'm talking about, just go outside and look at the world without any motive, without any preconceived notion. And you will see, I have a little I have a little um, notebook I have on my laptop and on my iPhone that I write ideas all the time, right? Every time I see something, you know, why something is not working or how I think something could work better, I would write in the note, notebook. I would encourage you to do that, okay? Don't accept things as they are, okay? So we have Google today. Well, what's beyond Google? We have Facebook today. What's beyond Facebook? Okay. Don't just accept what we have now and say, well, we're just going to middle fix it a little bit, make it a tiny little bit better. What if you blow up the whole model and start again? What would you do? Okay. Somebody asked me, you know, what's the hardest thing for me to do? Those are the hardest thing to do, but to say, okay, what if we create a new paradigm what would it look like 
how would we make it work and how would we get make it accessible to everybody okay ask those questions and as long as you continue to ask those questions you will find meaning in what you do and you will love what you do and the world will be a much better place um I wanted to ask too, is there any type of engineering that you feel is most socially relevant? Uh, it, you, you can be, you can do any kind of engineering and make it social re relevant because you will ask the right questions, right? You know, you're gonna build a better motorcycle, right? You are going to create a better, Roof, which is what one of my entrepreneurs is working on, right? You are going to create a better network. You can, you go into make better, you know, better way to deliver energy. Any kind of engineering you can think of, you can make it social relevance. It is entirely up to you and you alone to figure that out, okay? And to have the courage to say, this is what I really want to do. All right, if those are all the questions, thank you so much, Dr. La, I know you stayed. Thank you. Well, a lot longer than you um, Good had originally planned. But yeah, thank you so much for a very inspirational talk. I hope that everyone really enjoyed that. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.